So, Joelle Puccio is Director of Women's Services and the People's Harm Reduction Alliance in Seattle. 13 years of experience from the Child Abuse Center, Level 3 NICU. Um, her main uh, interest is this intersection of drug, drug users' rights and feminism. So, let's give a warm welcome to Joelle. Before I begin my presentations, usually I make an acknowledgement of the land we're standing on properly belongs to such and such indigenous tribe. Today, we're lucky enough to be standing on land that rightfully and legally belongs to the nations of Tulalip. In the language of the nations of Tulalip, which is Lushootsi, the way to say thank you is Tiwitsi. So I'll repeat that a few times. Please thank our hosts with me as you enjoy this beautiful facility. Tee Wee Tee Wee Thank you. All right. So my background is kind of unique because I have a lot of experience in hospitals, and I also have a lot of experience doing direct service literally in an alley on the streets with people who use drugs. So I'm a NICU and postpartum nurse at a hospital, just some hospital, who knows which one. Um, I also am the director of women's services at the People's Harm Reduction Alliance, which is a nonprofit drug user run needle exchange in Seattle near the University of Washington. So harm reduction is kind of a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, and a lot of people have different definitions of what it means. And I like that about it because it can be really broad and it can be applied to various different situations. One definition that I love is from the Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a national organization based out of New York. They have an excellent website with harm reduction resources if you're interested. Harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Harm reduction is also a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. Other places where you might hear harm reduction applied is in populations who engage in sex work and imprisoned or formerly imprisoned populations, but really it can be applied to almost any situation. So, harm reduction in action. Something that people may have heard of associated with harm reduction is the concept of needle exchange, where people who use needles to inject drugs can bring their dirty ones and get clean ones back. Other things um, are seatbelts. We cannot eliminate the dangers of riding in motor vehicles, but we can significantly reduce them to an acceptable level. And that's kind of the basic idea of harm reduction. Uh, my habits these days are pretty tame, but I'll just give you a couple PG examples from my own life. I watch a lot more Netflix than I'm totally willing to admit. And I, I think that it would be unrealistic and maybe even inappropriate to eliminate it completely from my life. But I'm the kind of person who loves making intricate plans and rules and um, kind of even formulas about the way I engage in habits that could become destructive if they're too much. So I'm only allowed to watch so much Netflix per day. Um, every so often I have to throw in something healthy like a documentary, things like that. So that's a situation where I use harm reduction to reduce the amount or the, the amount of unhealthy stuff that I watch. Another example is from just yesterday. I was at a friend's house for brunch. She had a brand new espresso machine. So I said, sure, give me one. She had these cute little demi-toss too. So um, I had an espresso at one o'clock in the afternoon. I figured, oh, that'll be fine. I have to wake up at five tomorrow, no big deal. As I was laying awake last night or this morning at 3 a.m., I realized that was a mistake. So 10 years ago, I probably would have laid there just beating myself up. You idiot, what were you thinking? How could you do this? You've sabotaged yourself. You'll never do a good job tomorrow. But instead of that, I just kind of slowed myself down and I said, hey Joelle, you messed up. Now you know better. 
no espresso after 7 a.m. in the future. And then I just kind of let my thoughts wander, try to do some meditation and relax. So that's a situation where I use harm reduction just as a form of self-care. So it can be really, really widely applied. At the bottom of this slide, the phrase, any positive change, that is a phrase from Dan Big of the Chicago Recovery Alliance Needle Exchange. And I really love that because it is so simple and it basically embodies harm reduction. Any positive change is celebrated. It's important to note those positive changes are defined by the person, not by us. Another phrase that I really love from Kenneth Anderson and Ham's Harm Reduction for Alcohol is better is better. So what that means is any way you can do better is great. So let's say that you get hammered every single day of the week. But if you can, maybe you still get hammered, but now you take a taxi home instead of driving. That's better, and we're going to celebrate that, even though it's perhaps not what the ultimate goal that the provider would choose, any positive change should be celebrated. Language and nonverbal mes messages can be really, really important in letting your client or patient know what kind of a provider you are and whether they can trust you. Um, some examples. We could when I'm giving report off to the next nurse and the mom sitting over there on the couch, I could say, baby Isabel's mom is an addict. Or I could say, this is baby Isabel, her mom had a heroin use disorder. Not only is it less stigmatizing, but it's also consistent with DSM-5 language, which we should all be using. We want to use person-first language. So um, that means instead of calling someone an addict, or saying they're a user, we say this is a person with such and such a disorder. Another way that we can change the, the messages that we give is by saying, say, instead of, because of your drug use, your baby's going to have problems. Another way we could say, we can communicate the same information without adding to the internal and external stigma that person is feeling is saying, babies like Isabel with prenatal substance exposure just need a little extra cuddling in the beginning. Language and word choices can be really powerful. Instead of drug addict, we use person first. Person with substance use disorder. Um, drug abuse is automatically a judgment statement. Not all use is abuse. And so it's important to use substance use instead of drug abuse. No baby is ever born addicted. It is not possible. As most of you probably are aware, addiction is a set of compulsive behaviors such as drug seeking and messing up in various aspects of your personal and professional life. Babies are incapable of doing any of that. So anytime we see the media especially talking about babies born addicted, please challenge that. Letters to the editor, let's do it. Another good one is uh, rather than medication maintenance treatment, we should say medication assisted treatment. I've got two reasons for that one. When we say maintenance, it suggests that we are replacing one addiction with another, which is something that the detractors of harm reduction say a lot about methadone and buprenorphine. Using medication-assisted treatment, it also implies that medication is not the only thing we're doing. So there's also going to be group therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapy, lifestyle changes, socioeconomic supports, and the whole package involves medication, but is not solely medication. Language and conceptualization. conceptualization. This one re is referring more to your posters and your pamphlets and various literature that um, gets passed out in offices and, and clinics. The concept of the dyad, the mother or birth parent and the baby. That's really, really important. It's already been stressed previously and I'm going to stress it again because that's how important it is. The interests of one cannot be separated from the interests of the other. We're going to go into that a little bit more later. Using inclusive language can be really, really beneficial, especially to people who have the capability to become pregnant, but perhaps don't identify as female. 
there are just an unlimited amount of gender identities out there. Some of those people can become pregnant. That includes transgender men, people who are non-binary, and also two-spirit. Another thing that is important is people don't always use the terms for their body parts that we might expect. Um, sometimes with transgender men, in my experience, they don't use the word breastfeeding. They prefer chest feeding because they don't refer to that part of their body as a breast anymore. If you're unsure about terms, um, gender pronouns, body parts, just ask. a little bit, neonatal abstinence syndrome is not fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. NAS is specific to opioids. There is no defined syndrome that has been established for stimulants, for cannabis, for other kinds of medications, or uh, not medications, excuse me, for other kinds of illicit substances. NAS is unpredictable. It doesn't seem to be dose responsive when we do studies, so that suggests to me that there must be some other factors at play in there. Um, not every infant with exposure will develop NAS. Presentation can be really difficult because many of the signs of NAS are also normal newborn behavior, such as crying until you get fed. We all know that babies do that, and that can also be a sign of NAS. As Dr. Walsh said, NAS is treatable. We have uh, pharmacological interventions and supportive interventions, which I'll get into a little bit later. It's also temporary. After days to weeks of treatment, it is finished and done, and you move on and you've got a normal baby. The prognosis is very good. There are no long-term complications. Babies tend to do just about as well as other children with a similar socioeconomic status and race. signs of NAS. What does it look like? We've all seen the terrible articles and uh, news stories that just show these horrible babies just screaming and going like this. That is part of it, but that's not typical, especially not if there's adequate care. So signs of NAS are increased muscle tone. That means both your baby is kind of tremoring, jittery a little bit, and also they're just stiff as a board. Normal newborn assessment, you lift the baby up by the arms and they kind of lag a little bit as they come up. With a NAS baby, they're just going to come up stiff as a board like they're doing sit-ups. Their head won't even droop backwards. They're just tight all the time. Tremors can be disturbed or undisturbed, and that's just when their little arms and legs are going like this all the time. That can lead to skin breakdown as elbows, knees, and other parts of the body rub against blankets and swaddles. Babies tend to be quite irritable, so they are they kind of ramp up their cry faster and they take longer to settle back down again. They may cry more often, awake more frequently. Um, a lot of newborns won't tolerate having a wet diaper for any amount of time. With NAS babies, that's amplified. Once the diaper's messy, they're going to cry until you fix it. Poor feeding and weight gain can also be a part of NAS. As we know with grown-ups, with withdrawal, you get an upset tummy, you get some diarrhea, you have a lot of gastrointestinal involvement. So that's true for babies as well. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Poor sleep, as I said, they wake up frequently, they get pissed off at the drop of the hat, and it takes them a long time to mellow back out again. If it's left untreated, NAS can progress to seizures related to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance, just from all that energy use and um, poor feeding. Substance use disorder in pregnant people should be treated as a comorbidity. It's not a whole different patient. It's a pregnant person and this is the thing that they have on the side. Um, just like someone with diabetes or cholestasis in pregnancy or any other comorbidity. So that means that these patients require all of the same stuff that any other pregnant or childbearing patient needs. That includes pumping the breasts to maintain milk supply, 
skin-to-skin -skin holding with their baby as much as possible. And when I say that, I am not exaggerating. 24 hours a day if possible, bathroom breaks only. Pain control can be really significant for these patients because, especially if they're using opioids, they're going to have a higher tolerance. Uh, usually epidural or spinal works just great. However, if they need to take postpartum pain medications, they can require much, much higher doses than we'd be comfortable giving to an opioid naive patient. It's important that they know that they're entitled to adequate pain control and they can advocate for themselves if necessary in the hospital. Sometimes providers get a little bit nervous about giving somebody three, four times the regular dose, but sometimes that's what they need. Again, benefits for the parents are benefits for the baby. Every person on the care team should have plan A as keeping the family together. That should be the ideal goal. If it's not possible, of course, have contingency plans, but that should be the goal for everyone. Effective, engaged, and confident parents are gonna benefit the baby. Any baby, as soon as they're born, the only thing they want is to get right back in there. Closest thing we can do to that is just have the mom be close so the baby can smell her, hear her, and be held by her or him as much as possible. <coughs> parents' own milk benefits the baby. There are numerous <coughs> studies to support that. There are numerous studies to support that. It's gone off. Is it back? Okay. Um, and that can be state regulation, blood sugar. Breast or chest feeding can help the baby regulate state, blood sugar, temperature. Um, it also increases the parent confidence because it's really, really empowering to think, I am providing my baby with something nobody else can. A lot of times parents are having a lot of internalized stigma and they're just not feeling confident in caring for their child. So they look at this NICU nurse and, oh, she can wrap them so tight, she calms them right down. But one thing that I can't do, that every parent can do, is provide human milk. It's also good for the childbearing parent as well. Providing human milk and skin-to-skin -skin care decreases the risk of postpartum bleeding, increases human milk production, and just confidence. Developing a therapeutic relationship with these patients is extremely important. Especially people who are using illicit substances, they don't likely have a good relationship with very many healthcare providers or really um, institutional people in general. They're going to mostly <coughs> avoid that kind of situation and they likely have some experiences in their past where they had um, abusive or negative experiences with providers. It's important to expect the best and prepare for the best. A lot of times when these people come in, the providers just say, oh, she's a heroin user, she's not gonna get custody of that baby, I'm just gonna not take that good care of her. Oh, I'm just gonna not start her breast pumping because she'll never stay sober. That's really, really uh, sending a negative message to your patient that you cannot be trusted and that you don't have their best interest at heart. So it's really important to establish that early. Understanding a typical and atypical course of recovery can be really beneficial as well. A lot of times we ask people to meet this bar that's way up here, and it's basically perfection. That's not the typical course for most people. It's important to expect good days and bad days, ups and downs, and to let the person know that if you do have a bad day, if you mess up, it's not the end of the world. Let's be honest about it and let's make a plan to not let that happen in the future. Reinforcing positive behaviors can be really beneficial because a lot of times these moms don't have much confidence. Maybe they don't have any experience with babies before. So even little things. Sometimes a mom will walk in and the baby just kind of starts fussing and she'll go and pick the baby up. That can be an opportunity to say, wow, what great maternal instincts you have. That's exactly what your baby wanted, and you just knew it, and you did the right thing. Being truthful about what you know and don't know is really, really important. 
These people are usually very good at spotting BS, especially if someone is hustling to support a two, three hundred dollar a day habit. They can, they have really good people skills, so they're going to know if you're selling them something that they don't want. It's also important to let them know what you control and don't control. A lot of times people will ask me if I can guarantee that they'll get to keep custody of their baby and I have to say, that's really not up to me. I'm going to do my best, I'm going to support you, I'm going to let you know what I think will help you keep custody, but it's, it's not up to me. Being willing to learn from your patients is just such a huge relief to people because they know drugs. People who use drugs know what they're talking about. And sometimes when healthcare providers don't know a lot about drugs, they tend to get kind of rigid and standoffish and pretend that they know more than they do. And again, people who use drugs, who hustle, they can spot that a mile away. Documenting interactions with parents and family is a really big part of a nurse's job because we are the liaison a lot of times between social work, CPS, and the parent. That social worker is not going to be in the room for 8 hours a day or 12 hours a day watching those parents. It's also important to let the parents know what you see and what you're going to document. So, for example, I'll say, it's so nice to see the loving relationship you have with your partner and how well behaved your two-year-old is and she looks so healthy and happy. I'm going to put that in the chart for you. It's also important to let them know that if you see abusive behavior between parents or if the toddler is underdressed for conditions or appears malnourished, you're going to have to make a note of that just because it's important for the baby's well-being. Another really important thing to do is don't make assumptions about your patients with substance use disorder. It's, I've, I've done it and I, I try to do better every day. A lot of times people assume that especially women with substance use disorder have all been raped or trafficked or abused as children or done sex work and that's not the case with everyone. Another assumption I've made in the past that had to be corrected was that everyone who uses heroin uses needles. Not true. There are multiple methods of ingestion that don't involve needles. Many families report adversarial relationship with child welfare and social work, as Lene spoke about earlier. A lot of people perceive that they're considered guilty until proven innocent, rather than the other way around. Substance use is not child abuse or neglect, although it is legally defined as such in 15 states in the District of Columbia, but not our state. Yay. As Lene as talked about earlier, the burden of meeting requirements can be insurmountable for people, especially if somebody is unhoused, living a chaotic lifestyle, um, going through cycles of high and withdrawal, high and withdrawal, even making it to one appointment a week can be really difficult. For a lot of these families, there can be appointments with social work and child welfare and drug court and lawyers and just your regular postpartum appointments, which are uh, overwhelming enough for a lot of families, such as the hearing screen and the well baby check and the postpartum check with the OB and the pediatrician appointments. If there are specialists involved, such as for a premature baby, it can be even more. It's a full-time job to make it to all these appointments. Add to that sometimes scheduled, sometimes unscheduled home visits. It can be just an extremely stressful experience for families. Another issue is that at times there's no defined endpoint for child protection surveillance. So some people could be under surveillance or, uh, or assistance for years. The purpose of CPS is to assist families to create a healthy and safe environment for their child. A lot of families don't perceive it that way and uh, that, that can be a barrier. Parents own milk and skin to skin, going a little bit more detail here. Like I said before, increases confidence and motivation to show up at the hospital. For a lot of people with that internal and external stigma, just walking into the NICU and seeing all these nurses 
who know what you did can be really daunting. So having the ability to come every day and bring breast milk or chest or parents' own milk for your child, that can be a confidence booster like, hey, I'm here, I'm doing something positive for my baby. It can also be a really great motivation for sobriety. If you have to pump every three to four hours, that's really gonna, when you're making that decision to use or to not use, that's gonna influence you pretty heavily. Every parent wants what's best for their baby, and they, they're all doing the best they can. It's also really important to let people know about clearance times for drugs, so to prepare for a potential relapse. So the, the times vary for various drugs, but they can ask their healthcare provider about that kind of thing. Numerous health benefits to baby, we already went over. If somebody comes in and they've been using cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine and who knows what else, it's okay to still get them started breast pumping. Ideally, we want people to start pumping within six hours of birth. Even if they're just pumping to get their milk supply started and coming in, that's so, so important. Even waiting a day can end up in severe reductions in milk supply. A lot of misconceptions about providing human milk are that there are just so many contraindications. So here I just provided a quick list of what is not a contraindication. Hepatitis C, methadone or buprenorphine treatment, unhoused status, other children not in custody, or incarceration. Every person should be given the opportunity to provide human milk for their child. So environment, this is going to be stuff that anybody can do, anybody in the family or family friends, just to help make that baby a little bit more comfortable as they go through their neonatal abstinence syndrome. So positioning, like I said before, as soon as a baby's born, they just want to get back in there where it's cozy and warm. So we position the baby in a C position or fetal position as it's more commonly known. A tight swaddle is really important. Because especially in later gestation, anytime that baby moves around, it's going to hit the uterus wall. And so that's a comfortable boundary for babies. So a tight swaddle kind of recreates that and makes them, when they get startled, they go, and then they're like, oh, I hit something. I'm safe. It's okay. Being held as much as possible can really, really help. I've even seen it reduce the need for pharmacological intervention. Holding and breastfeeding are by far the best interventions we have for these babies. At this point, my camera died, so we'll continue the presentation this way. Lighting in the room can be very beneficial for baby. We want soft, indirect light that's not directly in your face. Decreased sound can be a tricky one, especially in a noisy NICU. Sometimes if you can't make it quiet in the room, what you can do is use a white noise machine with maybe a heartbeat or ocean waves, something like that that's calming and soothing for the baby. The temperature should be kept really cool, especially by comparison to NICU standards. These babies are using up a lot of muscle energy to do their tremors and fighting and crying, and that creates a lot of heat. So sometimes they can get overheated and sweaty and just really uncomfortable. Leaving the swaddle open at the feet and tight around the arms can maintain that tight, comfortable swaddle for babies while also keeping sure that they don't get too hot. Feeding babies with NAS can be a challenge because they have higher energy requirements related to all the movement they're doing, and they also have stomach upset. So frequent, smaller volumes can be a better way to feed these kids while giving them enough energy and also keeping them from doing too much throwing up and stomach upset. If there's no breakdown near their little bottoms, you can increase the calories either with high calorie formula or by fortifying the parent's own milk with some kind of human milk fortifier. The trouble with a lot of these fortifiers is that they can cause increased diarrhea and the poops just get a little bit more irritating to the skin. So you really have to find a balance between protecting the skin and providing enough energy for the baby. 
Efficient use of energy can be a challenge, especially for preemies, because their suck, swallow, breathe is just not very coordinated at times. So we can use bottles with a higher flow rather than the slow flow nipple that we would usually use for a term baby. Limiting the time at breast for premature babies can be helpful. We want the whole feeding to take 30 minutes or less. So that might mean 15, 20 minutes in the breast, and then you have to stop and cut it short and give them the bottle just to make sure they get enough volume during that time. Clustering care tasks can be helpful as well. So we're not waking this baby up every few minutes to check the diaper or give medications. I'm going to go in, get everything I need right there at the bedside. I'm going to wake the baby, do the assessment, change the diaper, do the score, give any medications, and do everything I need to do all at once so that that baby can have long interrupted sleep, uninterrupted sleep. The timing of doing the neonatal abstinence score and the morphine dose is vital. Scoring has to be done on a baby who's awake and calm. Um, items such as undisturbed tremors require that a baby be not touched for 30 seconds and then observed. If a baby's too fussy, you can give them a little bit of their feeding and then do the score. But it's important to do it before the morphine dose because you want to get a score that reflects the baby's behavior and state without their morphine dose. Never wake a baby for the dose. Usually dosing is written every three to four hours and it can be possible to do it if the baby's sleeping if you're unable to coordinate it with the times the baby wakes for food. Term babies can swallow in, your, in their sleep. You just put the oral syringe in their mouth and squirt in a little at a time and they take it right down. A preterm baby might have a little more trouble, so you just kind of raise their head up a little bit to make sure they don't choke and do it nice and slow in the mouth. If they have a gavage tube going down the nose and into the belly, you can give it that way and they don't even have to wake up or swallow at all. Accurate scoring and consistent scoring between providers can be quite a challenge. Interval scores are things for which the baby has to be observed during the whole interval, so between feedings, which is sometimes two to four hours. So like how many times they sneeze or yawn, how much sleep they've had. Another, other challenging items can be high-pitched cry. What exactly does high-pitched mean? Different things to different people. So th those items can provide challenges for accuracy and consistency. During shift change, it can be difficult. Say I'm coming on at 3 and the baby needs to eat at 3.30. The previous nurse is going to have to do part of the score for things such as how long the baby slept and sneezes and yawns, and I'm going to be doing the score for baby's muscle tone and how much they're crying and their current state. By far, the most important items of the neonatal abstinence score are can the baby eat, can the baby sleep, and is there skin breakdown. Seizure activity, of course, is also important, but we don't usually see that in the hospital with adequate treatment. Providing skin protection is a really easy way that we can decrease the baby's general discomfort. Tremors can cause breakdown on knees, elbows, heels, and other body parts that stick out. Frantic nipple seeking, which is a very normal newborn behavior where they kind of open their mouth and shake their head looking for a needle or a nipple, <laughs> can also cause skin breakdown on the chin. That breakdown can be really hard to treat once it happens because it's constantly being covered with slobber and spit and milk and lots of other stuff that makes it kind of gross. A, an easy way to provide protection is to put a hydrocolloid dressing on the affected areas. That's a water-based kind of gel tape that covers the area and keeps it from rubbing on anything. Lastly, I want to talk about social supports for the whole family. Every person who uses drugs and wants to stop needs to look at reasons that they started and why they continued substance use. This can be the obvious stuff that gets all the attention, like violence, poverty, trauma. It can also be as simple as having enough energy to work several jobs or attend school, being able to get to sleep at night if you have anxiety, or even just being a part of a community. Many people who use drugs find that they are a part of a really close-knit community. Whenever you're an outsider, going against the law, outlaw, um, those kinds of people tend to form really strong bonds. 
We also want to acknowledge reasons for avoidance in seeking care or delay in seeking either prenatal care or drug treatment. Oftentimes people are afraid of social services or law enforcement intervention, especially if they've had that experience in the past. People are afraid of admitting even to themselves sometimes or family because they're afraid that people will ostracize them and they'll be rejected if people know that they're using drugs. Loss of control is a really big barrier because letting someone else know this very intimate detail about your life can mean that you no longer have control. Treatment sometimes involves separation from family, loss of job, socioeconomic barriers as well. Oftentimes I'll talk to parents who said, as soon as I found out I got pregnant, I was going to stop. I was going to stop by 12 weeks and then get prenatal care. And then I was going to stop at 16 weeks and then 20 weeks. And without help, it's really hard for people to stop. And so sometimes it just goes on and on and on. And then they're at 38 weeks and they're delivering and they're in the hospital. One family that I worked with that didn't seek prenatal care, um, it was a young couple. They already had a toddler. Daddy worked 12, 14 hours a day, six days a week. They only had one car, and they lived in a rural area. So it was just socioeconomically not possible for her to be able to go and get prenatal care. Now I'd like to go over some questions from the audience after the presentation. The first question was about skin-to-skin -skin care and how to facilitate it. This is a multifaceted issue. Firstly, you have to provide a welcoming environment in the hospital or the parent's not going to show up. Secondly, you have to provide an environment, especially in your NICU, where there's somewhere for the parent to be. There needs to be a couch, a bed, a recliner. There needs to be a bathroom nearby, somewhere to store food, ideally somewhere that the person can take a shower. And then, finally, it has to be a priority of staff. Staff know that skin-to-skin -skin care is the best thing for any baby, especially a baby with particular health needs. So making that a priority, even when the person is someone who uses drugs, can really help facilitate skin-to-skin -skin care in the NICU. So it's a combination of parents, staff, and hospital administrators. This question presents a really heartbreaking situation for a lot of providers because in this situation, the patient is not going to do what you want. So in that case, the most important thing is to not abandon your patient. It's not only unethical, but it's not going to provide a good outcome for the patient or the baby. So if somebody does not want to do the course of action that's recommended, the most important thing is to make sure the patient understands what's going to happen. So if you continue to use illicit substances and you don't go to treatment, you are unlikely to retain custody of your child. That's a really tough conversation to have, but it's one that the patient deserves. After that, it's just working on harm reduction. So this path is not acceptable to you. What do you feel like you want to do? What do you want your life to look like? And how can I help you accomplish that? But first and foremost, do not abandon your patient. This one is my favorite. There are a number of people who feel that women who use drugs and repeatedly become pregnant should be either forcibly or coercively sterilized or provided long-term contraception such as IUDs um, or hysterectomies. Basically, when you're telling that to your patient, you're saying, you do not deserve to reproduce. We don't want more people like you. That's an extremely unethical and harmful thing to tell any patient. And furthermore, it is not our job to make healthcare decisions for our patients. It is never too late for someone to make a positive change in their life, and it is our job to support the patient's decisions. Over my dead body will healthcare providers make reproductive decisions for their patients. This is a link to an eight-minute video put out by the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Their website is advocatesforpregnantwomen.org. This video delves a little bit deeper into some of the horrors of these kinds of programs and talks to some families affected by them. Check it out. Something that comes up a lot is whether or not we should do body fluid testing on all pregnant people for substance use. This is a practice that has been deemed unnecessarily costly 
both for the patients and for the healthcare system in general. And the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends that all women should be screened with questions and talking, but that blood or urine or other body fluid testing should only be performed if the screening comes up positive. This is one of my favorite questions because I'm a big fan of safe consumption rooms. I use the terminology safe consumption room rather than safe injection site because smoking heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine is much safer than injecting. And if we're only going to provide services for people who inject, there's, it is possible that people might switch from a safer method to injecting just in order to access these services. There is tons of data out of Europe and also in North America, Vancouver, BC has Insight, which has been in operation for I think about 18 years. And the data on these sites shows that they reduce deaths and disease while also helping the neighborhoods keeping cleaner and reducing needle litter. There are no recorded overdoses at Insight and they've reversed hundreds or possibly even thousands by now. So the data is really, really strong in support of these sites. The drug using population is notoriously difficult to get at. They don't access care very frequently. And these sites can be uh, the first place where a person develops a good positive relationship with a healthcare provider and it could lead to other things. Seattle is considering safe injection rooms or safe consumption rooms, which would be really beneficial, especially in our cold environment, because as you probably know, injecting someone who's cold and their veins are shrunken up is really difficult. So even just providing a warm, welcoming space can be helpful. There's a lot of NIMBYs or not in my backyard types who think that safe consumption sites will bring more drug users to the area, but when we do studies we find that people are not going to travel that far. If you're sick and your nose is running and you're about to vomit and you need to get well, you're not going to go more than a few blocks to access a safe consumption site. Most of the sites being considered already have a high volume of public drug use in the area, so this would actually be benefiting those NIMBYs rather than adding to the problem. This is a link to an article about a group of healthcare providers in the Seattle area who are working towards safer consumption rooms. They recently staged a die-in at City Hall where they all went in and laid down on the ground and pretended to be dead because that is what's going to happen every day that we don't have a safe consumption room in this city. Thanks for watching. Feel free to find me on social media and contact me for questions or comments.